output via testing that can improve the reliability of C++ applications. And this is about fast testing. Our agenda will lay out a framework to understand and utilize this kind of testing method effectively. And a tricky moment, I hope you see my next slide. So firstly, we'll start with definitions where the, we'll clarify key terms and concepts that are foundational to fast testing. Next, under fast and key challenges, we will discuss some of the complexities that we face when implemented fast testing. Moving forward, we'll delve into fast testing tools. After that, we'll cover fast and metrics. This section will focus on how we can measure the effectiveness of our fast testing efforts. And finally, we'll conclude with fuzzer benchmarking. This is where we'll see how to compare different fuzzers. So let's get started with some definitions. The software development life cycle comprises several stages like planning, designing, implementing, and testing, the stage we will be discussing, followed by deployment, maintenance, and then it cycles back to the next iteration, and so on and so forth. There are various types of tests, such as unit test, integration test, functional test, among others. Despite their differences, these tests, almost all, share a common, a common element. They all verify the output of the program or its components against expected results, which we then compare with the actual output. For instance, let's consider a unit test. We have a specific unit or function that we aim to test. This function takes standard arguments and it produces a result. We then compare this actual result with an expected outcome. Thus, for each argument, there is a corresponding expected result value. The primary indicator of testing efficiency is code coverage, right? Our goal is to cover as much of our code as possible not necessarily 100%, but we aim to get as close to that figure as we can. To achieve this, we generate various arguments and expected results, crafting multiple test cases to cover the code as thoroughly as possible. However, besides coverage, what other factors should we consider? When it comes to exploring path, of our code. Our objective is not only to achieve coverage of certain path within our code, but also to discover as many paths as possible. In the context of path exploration, attaining 100% code coverage does not necessarily imply that all possible paths have been explored. Here we have a series of test cases, and each of one contributes to the overall coverage value. However, we can also observe that each test case follows its own path. The white arrows and circles indicate portions of the program that remains undiscovered. Therefore, we do not reach these sections of the code, and as a result, they remain untested. This slide introduced to the fundamental concept of basic blocks in, and their coverage. The program presented here is composed of several basic blocks, each denoted by B, followed by a numerical index. In the columns uh, to the right, you will notice dots that corresponds to various test cases, labeled as T1, T2, and so on and so forth, indicating which test case cover corresponding basic blocks. To the right, you'll find the execution tree, which includes a series of basic blocks interconnected with each other, and the colored arrows illustrate the potential execution path the program may follow for each test case. Our objective is to cover all, or at least majority of the possible path within the program, and this coverage ensures that our program will function reliably when deployed in a production environment. And this is where fuzzing comes up. Fuzzing is an automated process where a program is pushed with invalid, semi-valid, or totally unexpected data. And this technique is aimed 
at uncovering hidden vulnerabilities that might not surface under standard testing procedures. The key outcomes we look for are critical issues such as system crashes, violation of code assertions, potential memory leaks, all of which are indicative of underlying problems uh, that need to be addressed. The general workflow of fuzzing includes several steps like monitoring, mutation, test case generation and filtering. The process then circles back to monitoring equipped with the updated test cases. And the last stage is bug detection and analysis. As a result of this process, potential vulnerabilities, bugs within the target program are uncovered and can be addressed then. To streamline the complexity of the previous scheme of fuzzing process, it can be broken down into three main stages. First is program execution and runtime monitoring. This initial stage involves execution, the program and monitoring its runtime behavior, and the approach taken depends on our level of knowledge and or access to the program, which can be categorized as follows. First is black box. Here we have no specific knowledge about the program or how it works. The white box in opposite, here we have complete understanding of the program, access to the source code, and the ability to integrate specialized fuzzy and functionalities into the source code itself. And the gray box is in the middle when we have partial access and not so many knowledge about the program. The second stage, big stage, is test case generation. During this stage, we either mutate existing test cases or generate new ones. So to generate test case effectively, we must adhere to certain rules that guide us in producing data that is more likely to trigger issues within the program. And mutation involves altering test cases at random or using algorithms such as genetic algorithms without strictly following predefined rules. The third stage is bug, an bug analysis and this is the final stage involves the examination of discovered issues including crashes, vulnerabilities, bugs. This process includes an analysis to understand and categorize the bugs that had been identified. Let's proceed with fuzzing K challenges then. And the first challenge is how to bypass the validation of the target program. An effective fuzzer should generate semi-valid inputs that are valid enough on one hand, so they are not directly rejected by the first stage of the program, its validation stage or some kind of validation. Or on the other hand, they should be invalid enough to expose the corner cases that have not been properly dealt with. To achieve the balance between valid enough or invalid enough, input data must choose a strategy. Should we generate or mutate input data? The first approach is generation-based, which constructs inputs from scratch based on formal rules such as Gremel, grammar rules or protocols like protobuf. It requires more knowledge and preparation, but can yield more thorough testing results. The second approach is mutation-based. This method modifies existing valid inputs to create new potentially invalid test cases. This approach is simpler and quicker to implement, but the outcomes may less comprehensive in comparison to the generation-based approach. We can enhance the mutation-based approach by implementing a form of seed selection after mutation. This allows us to choose seeds that explore new paths in our program, thereby achieving a higher level of coverage as a result of fast testing. Here you can see an example of mutation applied to a image data and its implementation in a fuzzing process like using smart mutation to choose that varieties of test data which allows us to achieve a new path in the program. And mutation for string data can be seen on the current slide. Here we have two initial 
test cases presented as T1 and T2 with corresponding X and Y values. We can observe the mutations of the first test, it's T3 and T4, because its cases start also with the letter X, and the mutation of the second test case, denoted as T5, it starts from Y as second test case. So additionally, dot marks represent the basic blocks covered by this mutated and original test cases. The white paper, a link to it you can find at the bottom on this slide, present a study of two methods of dynamic application analysis, like mutation-based fuzzing and generation-based fuzzing. And the difference of this method was calculated as an amount of executed code required to parse PNG image files. The comparison of code coverage results shown on the figure and on the figure, mute refers to the mutation-based fuzzing techniques. There are several attempts, and gen refers to the generation-based test cases. The initial file with five chunks covers 60% more code than the minimal file, the base file used in the test. In this case, the based results were demonstrated, as we mentioned above, by generation fuzzing which allowed to achieve almost 290% more code coverage than the basic test. And then let's proceed with some fast testing tool and look into the practical aspects. There are a great number of fuzzers, and here we observe several of the most widely used open source fuzzers, not only for C++, but also for other languages like Golang, JavaScript, and others. And when discussing fuzzers for C++, we can categorize them into three families. First is the AFL family from American Fuzzy Lob, which includes several fuzzers such as AFL, AFL Fast, AFL++. Next, uh, there is Lib Fuzzer family, represented by leap fuzzer and entropic fuzzer. And lastly, there are other fuzzers, with the most popular among them being Hong Fuzz, developed by Google. So let's try one of these fuzzers, uh, the AFL++ fuzzer. And now I'm going to show you a simple use case of using AFL++ fuzzer, but before several notes about it. So AFL++ comes with a central compiler AFLCC that incorporates various different kinds of compiler targets and implementation options as well. The evaluation flow that is shown on the slide can help you with selecting the best possible options. We can select the mode for the AFLCC compiler by one of the following methods, like using symlink or using the environment variable, or maybe passing command line options to the compiler directly. It is possible to use sanitizers when instrumenting targets for fuzzing, which allows uh, us to find bugs that would not necessarily result in a crash. Note that sanitizers have a huge impact on CPU and RAM usage. So the following sanitizers have built-in support in AFL++. It's address sanitizer to find memory corruptions, memory sanitizers, which finds access to unnationalized memory, undefined behavior sanitizers, control flow, and several more sanitizers. Before we dive into using AFL++ compiler for fast testing, we compile our pretty simple test program using the regular GCC compiler and then disassemble the resulting binary file to see what kind of comments have been produced by the compiler. These comments can be observed at the right on the slide, and there are not so many comments, right? But uh, then we use AFL GCC compiler and binary file put into this assembler to read the instrumented code. AFL instruments a piece of code on each basic block, as shown on the slide, with the AFL maybe log function. This function allows AFL fuzzer to know if a certain point, aka basic block, can be reached or not. 
there is only one basic block in this program, so we can observe only one call of the AFL maybe log function. Let's look at more complicated target program. This program contains, uh, contains several conditional operators, including multiple nested if statements, which create several basic blocks in the compiled program. This program will be used to demonstrate the possibilities of fast testing, and in this case, the chain of the conditions checks the buffer content starting with the letter A, followed by B, then by C, which causes the program to crash, and this is simulated by using the abort function. Then we are going to create our seeds. Seeds are set of input values that will be fed into the target program. Based on these seeds, additional test cases will be created through mutation, as we mentioned above. The fuzzer will create a corpus of values based on the seeds, and we expect that one of the created cases will allow us to expose the crash simulated by the abort function. In this particular case, as an example, we expect to get something like the last corpus element, a string containing A, B, C, X, to produce the crush. So, let's start with demonstration of the AFL fuzzer. Here we observe the contained of the folder with our program, which contains check buff function. This function actually checks the buffer content. We can see the several nested if statements and the abort function, which caused our simulation of the crash. The main function takes some buffer and pass this buffer into check buff function. It's not so difficult, but pretty straightforward, I guess. And then we observe seeds we created. We created seeds in a separate folder named seeds, and each seed placed in the separate files like seed1, seed2, and c3. Its simple text file contains one or two symbols, for an example. So seeds1 contained letter x, then we check the seed2, and the second file contains letter a, and the last one seed3 file contains the some more complicated test case ax. So we start with these cases and let's see what will Fuzzer find in this case. So we should compile our source code into binary file and use here AFL GCC compiler. We got some warning which we should use modern compiler instead, but still this uh, GCC produce more simpler binary code to observe. That's why we use this older version of the compiler. Then we use GDB to get into the binary file and disassemble this file to see that instruments which we used by AFL fuzzer to check the coverage of the binary file. So let's put the disassemble command here and we can observe several calls of the AFL maybe log function here because we have several basic blocks at the start of the program and then each of the nested if statements will also be equipped by the AFL maybe log function. So that is how the AFL fuzzer instrument our program L will be check the coverage of the code. So several more calls of AFL maybe log function and the last when we check the C letter in buffer and then we can proceed with actual fuzzing. Okay, let's start fuzzing our program and see what we got. We use AFL fuzz command, pass 
the our seeds and the output file to check. And after some preparation, we see the process of fuzzing, which constantly push some inputs and generate more inputs. And currently our corpus count six elements and we can see that total crushes is one. So we catch our crush. There are many more parameters can be observed here. For example, total executions and also mutation algorithm used here also the CPU loading. So it's pretty extending. And since we get our result, we can check what it is. So the result is located in another folder and it is output, yeah, out default and crashes. We have only one crash and the file name includes several parameters we can check for instance, the number of repetition, the identificator, time to achieve this result, and so on. And in this file, we actually can see that string, that buffer content, which caused the crash. And this content is A, B, C, and B, and also several C. So the beginning allows us to achieve the crash, but the rest of the file seems like pretty weird or something like that. So this is our test case. But we are going to check another attempt. So we repeat our fuzzing with the same seeds, but check the result what we get after repeating one more time. So we run the command one more time, start fuzzing. And then we see that also total crashes is one marked by red. Okay, so we can stop here and check what the result we get in this time. And the content of the file will be different and also the name of the file shows that it's repetition two, the second repetition, and the content will be more concise in this case. Here we can see A, B, C, B, and that's all. So it's some kind of smart fuzzing, I guess, or smart mutation. So let's proceed with some fuzzing metrics because we can see a lot of options. We can check our fuzzy effectiveness, but let's discuss some of these fuzzing tools and some metrics, how to compare these tools or how to estimate uh, the efficiency of fuzzing. So there is a scientific paper aimed to propose some standard set of features to allow a comparison of fuzzing tools. It reviews the existing evaluation methods in the literature and discuss the existing metrics by evaluating several fuzzers under identical experimental conditions. After examining the obtained results, this paper recommends a set of practices, particularly on the metrics to be used, to allow proper comparison between different fuzzing proposals. In order to measure the performance of fuzzing algorithms, a wide range of metrics have been defined in the literature. Among the 36 analyzed papers, metrics can be categorized into three groups. First group is bug detection. These metrics are aimed to account for the number of de detected bugs, while the main objective of fuzzing is to detect bugs. The literature shows different manners to measure the performance of fuzzer in bug finding. For instance, it's possible to count the number of found bugs that other fuzzers have failed to detect is B2 criteria, or the total number of target crashes while testing, so it's B3, or maybe stability of finding bugs. It measures the variation of the detected bugs between repetitions. 
There is also the coverage metrics. Uh, metrics belonging into this category aim to quantify the percentage of the code that has been executed at least once during fast testing. These metrics can only be measured in scenarios where it's possible to instrument the source code in such a way that it's possible to detect the execution of the program with different levels of granularity, such as line, branches, path, or even functions, as we call it, basic block. In black box-based approaches, it's not possible to measure coverage metrics because there are not resources or access to measure them. However, in white box and gray box based approaches, it's usually possible to measure these metrics. And the third is performance metrics. This group of metrics measures fuzzers' performance in terms not directly related to previous two groups. These metrics include the number of tests or runs that it can execute within a specific time frame. Uh, the time needed to find the first bug or the execution speed. Analyzing this pretty big table, it can be observed that the most used metrics are the ones related to bugs. Only 12 of the proposals do not explicitly count the number of found bugs. Metrics related to coverage come second. 19 proposals are at least one coverage metrics have while six measures or one. This is because the most importance of coverage to access the quantity of executed code, as it's not possible to detect bugs in its unexecuted parts. Finally, it is shown that performance-related metrics are used in eight papers. The number of test metrics, like P1, is the only metrics used more than once. Apart from the metrics used, other factors can strongly influence the outcome of the assessments. As such, a set of experimental conditions must be defined to ensure that all of the experiments are performed under the same conditions. Uh, this equality in the experiment conditions allows to fair comparison between different fathers. So let's consider testing time in this perspective. This factor res, uh, refers to the duration of the fuzzing session. That is, it ranges uh, from the moment of the first input is generated until the last response is collected. The table on the slide lists different testing times found across different fuzzing proposals, ranging from 2 to 10, uh, to, sorry, to 1,000 hour, hours. However, 24 hours long tests are the most popular option while 10 of them set a longer testing time and six of the papers specify it less than 12 hours. After discussing the theoretical aspects, let's consider some practical cases for measuring the effectiveness of the fuzzing program. Now let's turn our attention to fuzzer benchmarking. And we are going to discuss two benchmarks, FuzzBench and Magma. And let's start with the first one, the FuzzBench benchmarking tool. This uh, slide introduces FuzzBench, a solution created by Google, described as Fuzzer Benchmarking as a Service. So FuzzBench offers a platform for assessing uh, the performance of fuzzers. And the process begins when a developer integrates their fuzzer into FuzzBench framework, followed by the integration being added to the FuzzBench repository. Subsequently, FuzzBench conducts a comprehensive experiment to test the newly integrated fuzzer against a suite of benchmarks. FuzzBench published a report comparing the performance of the fuzzers to other fuzzers, both on individual benchmarks and as aggregate. Here uh, we are going to observe the result provided by the paper entitled Comparing Fuzzers on a Level Playing Field with FuzzBench, which was published in 2022. And in addition, you can view a video presentation of this work using the link at the bottom of the slide later, I guess. The key metrics used in this comprehensive evaluation of fuzzing tools 
are follows. Uh, the first matrix assesses the effectiveness of each fuzzer by counting the number of ground truths, JT bugs, and is able to identify these JT bugs serve for verifying the fuzzer's capability to detect known vulnerabilities. And the second matrix measures the number of additional crashes, AC, found are not included in the ground truth datasets, offering insight into the tool ability to uncover new and potentially unknown bugs. And lastly, the third matrix is the number of distant crashes as a sum of two previous. The table shown uh, shows the ranking based on fuzzer's performance per benchmark. The lower rank is better and highlighted in blue with JT and green AC. Uh, there are best performing fuzzers per benchmark. And based on the results shown in the table, we observe that AFL++ and Hong Fuzz are ranked top for more benchmarks than the rest of the fuzzers. Uh, this table shows four different ranking approaches, different for a type of statistical analysis done, which are instead calculated across all benchmarks. We observe uh, that according to the Friedman ranking, both HongFast and AFL++ rank first for each of the metrics, DC, GT, and AC. Whereas according to the effect size ranking, HongFast ranks first in all but one case, and AFL++ ranked always either second or first in Friedman ranking, for example. We also observe, uh, based on the Friedman ranking, that two runners up group, two runner up group elements, uh, the one composed by AFL-based fuzzers, and the second is leaf fuzzers family, except for swapping fair fuzz and entropic fuzzer. Here we can see the number of total crashes found over all runs by each fuzzer per benchmark. Both AFL++ and Hong Fuzz rank first based on the number of groups, uh, ground truth bugs found followed by mopt fuzzer. While when considering the number of additional crashes highlighted in green, Hong Fuzz is the best fuzzer while AFL++ rank second. The number of bugs found by a given fuzzer that are, have not been found by any other fuzzers per benchmark presented on this slide in this table and highlighted in blue and green the best performing fuzzers per benchmark is definitely Hong Fuzz, especially if we look at this benchmark FFmpeg, it's 18, and Proj4, it's 40. It's pretty good. So actually, FuzzBench provides more information in its reports. For instance, the sample report is generated using 10 fuzzers against 24 real-world benchmarks and with 20 trials each and over duration of 24 hours. And we can check something in this report. This uh, report offers a detailed analysis of various fuzzing tools and uh, this report includes evaluation of specific targets, such as loyalty, size profiling for binaries, HankFuzz, which is a text shaping engine, libxml2, its widely used library for parsing XAML documents, and also the several more tools. And uh, the experiment summary shows us the percentage of the highest reached median bug coverage, higher value is better here at the left, and at the right, the average rank of fuzzers according to the median reached bug coverage. The report also shows the median relative code coverage on each benchmark. Here, fuzzers are sorted by fuzzer mean. The average median relative coverage highest is on the left, and the green background highlights the highest relative median coverage, and blue gradient background is high, uh, greater than 95% uh, relative median coverage value. And in this and following tables, the Hong Fuzz demonstrate not so good results as it was shown in the above mentioned paper. So median relative bug coverage presented here on each benchmark. And here, fuzzers are also sorted by fuzzer mean. And the 
better value moved to the left in this case, and the AFL father, and I guess AFL family fathers, is demonstrate better results here. And total unique bugs found on each benchmarks also can be found from the report. There are many more plots and graphs, uh, so the growth of mean code coverage over the time of fuzzing, or the increase of mean bug coverage over the time of fuzzing, or the distribution of rich code coverage. So please explore this report. There are so many interesting things if you are interested in testing. And uh, the magma says that uh, there is not so good in FuzzBench because FuzzBench does not consider bugs as an evaluation matrix. And this FuzzBench relies solely on coverage profiles. So let's check what is magma actually. Maybe this solution is better. So it's a ground truth fuzzing benchmark and is a, it's a benchmark in Suite comprising a set of open source libraries as well that are frequently used. For each ported bug, Magma adds source code level instrumentation to collect ground truth information about bugs reached or buggy code executed or maybe triggered, so where full fault conditions satisfied by input. And Magma also tracks the progress of a fuzzer in real time as FuzzBench does. So there are several interesting metrics provided by Magma, which I want to highlight. First of them is uh, the mean number of unique bugs triggered by each fuzzer against every target library. And the plot also contains the standard deviation bar, this thin black line across all campaigns. And uh, the last, it's calculated values of expected time to trigger bugs for every bug triggered during the evaluation. In the left column of the table, the list of known bugs is displayed. And the main section of the table compares several fuzzers based on the time it takes to reach each of the bug mentioned in the left column. More information about this can be found in the Magma paper, the only paper I managed to find as well. So we have explored concept, challenges, tools, metrics, and benchmarks related to fuzzing. However, this is just the beginning of a journey into the investigation of fuzzing tools. Also, there is much more to delve into, but we will conclude our discussion here. I will be happy to hear your questions and thank you very much.